I'm going to pause the recording.
Good evening. My name is Starlisha Michelle Gingrich, and I am the founder and executive director of Disrupt Theater Company. I bring greetings from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, on the land of the Susquehannock people. Without the thieving of this land that we now know as the United States, we would not be here. We honor the Susquehannock people and their stewardship of this land. Disrupt Theater Company is a product of a dream and a necessity. Our mission is to tell the stories of Black, Brown, Indigenous, LGBTQ+, people of color. Disrupt aims to be a space for folks on the margins to tell our stories from our perspective. I would like to thank first Tate for loaning us their Zoom account. And I would like to thank Creative Works of Lancaster for producing this show. Disrupt exists because of our wonderful donors. If you like what you see this evening and are moved to donate, there will be a slide at the end with our PayPal information. Live theater during a pandemic has its challenges, but it allows us to bring this cast from all over the country, Pennsylvania, Florida, and Colorado. At the end of the show, we will open up the chat for a few minutes so you can write well wishes to our cast and crew. It's our virtual version of a curtain call. So what happens when you put four very different people in a room together? Logic tells us that we will hear four very different opinions on every topic presented. Lydia R. Diamond gives us a glimpse into the lives of four smart people with unique views on race, class, respect in America, as they anticipate the election of the first black president. These complicated characters are not unlike the complicated people we encounter in real life. One of the most basic human needs is the need for validation. How we all seek and find that validation may or may not be indicative of our culture, upbringing, and education. As you watch the show this evening, I encourage you to think of how you respond to the smart people in your life. Thank you and enjoy smart people. Prologue, September 2007. Valerie enters in leggings and sweatshirt, rumpled script in hand. She sports an Afro. She rehearses Portia with skill and authority early in the rehearsal process. You have, ungently Brutus, stole from my bed. And yesterday, at supper, you suddenly arose and... I have a thought. I've been working on Portia's backstory and I, I'm thinking we can deepen her. Just spit the fucking words out, please. Oh, okay. Uh, drive it then? Sure. Uh, just follow through. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Drive it hard. You suddenly arose and walked about, musing and sighing, with your arms across. And when I'd asked you what the matter was, you stared upon me with ungentle... A five-minute break? Now? Could, could we just... Okay, five minutes. Thank you. Terrific. Valerie removes a pack of cigarettes from her pocket and exits. Lights up on Brian lecturing. He holds a large stack of books, graded tests. Even at his angriest, there is an amused dedication. Please disabuse yourselves of this notion that I am obligated to teach you. Neither do I have an obligation to bestow upon you my, and I cite Harvard Review 2002, effortless charisma and probingly insightful tutelage. I am obligated only to show up and talk for two hours twice a week. Note my frustration. I am not frustrated because I see in you some great a collective untapped potential, I am frustrated because I will never have these two hours back. With the exception of three outstanding students, you have all failed miserably. So, Mr. Goldstein, Ms. Jones, and Mr. Schwab de Gala, you have distinguished yourselves as capable of not merely regurgitating information, but of actually absorbing and metabolizing it. You are excused from today's lecture. Really, go. I'm giving you the day off for being smart. Go. Thank you. 
Brian dumps the blue books into the garbage. All is forgiven. So we shall begin again. Okay, shake it off. I don't hold grudges. He rolls up his sleeves and turns to the screen behind him, onto which indecipherable charts, graphs, and matrices are projected. Light fades. Light rises on Ginny in another area, presenting in a psychiatry conference. Thank you for that flattering introduction, Dr. Thomason. You all have a copy of the study? We'll jump right in. We've interviewed 350 third generation Asian American women. Oh, you have a question already. Light rises on Jackson, removing bloodied surgical gown, being scolded by a superior. I did not raise my voice to Dr. Sandit. You did. No, no, I just pointed out the necessity of the amputation. Yes, Asian is broad. Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. It's there in your, could we hold our questions until after? What economic bracket were they from? It's a good question, but if we could just... <laughs> this person probably taught Orientalism in 58 and wants his moment in the sun. Y you'll see I've addressed that in... If we could return to... You! Stop that! No, I categorically reject that. I removed the first digit on the patient's left foot. My findings debunk Western assumptions naming primary reasons for anxiety and depression in Asian American women as familial. I did ask Dr. Sandeep for permission. He nodded. I know what a nod is. I speak fluent gestural shorthand. I'm trying to tell you, damn. Okay, so not from where we left off, forward to where then? I just need you to listen to me. Because I'm your best doctor. Disparaging of Western culture, really? Pejorative, no. Fine. Questions? Red shirt. Yes, 85% is what it says. Yeah, very good, 85. You're all very good at math. But people, what does it mean? I'm sorry, Neil here? Uh, uh, what is Buddhistic? And will he steal out of his wholesome bed to dare? Not at, upon my knees? Really? Okay. Valerie kneels and marks the script. These numbers represent real people who breathe and work and fuck, and they don't have time for you to sit in rooms and speculate about the 2% of the 75.3% that when factored into A equals an aggregate of some bullshit. Valerie rises and kneels, rises and kneels. The findings beg for a contextual framework. I'm talking context. Context, people. Go look at it. Not his chart, look at the patient. One subject spoke of the American male's attraction to her otherness. What is Brutus sick? What is Brutus sick? What is Brutus sick? No, you looked at his insurance status. <laughs> Hell yes, that's what I'm implying. Be the scientists persecuted for voicing that which is not palatable. What's the most non-palatable conclusion? There's only one. He's a 73-year-old, overweight, diabetic with a compromised heart and high blood pressure. The toe needed to go. Over and over, subjects noted the dominant culture's perception of our subjects as sexually promiscuous and scholastically dexterous. Three months night rotations. Again. No, I would not describe myself as a hothead. Well then fuck you. No, I'm sorry. Was that disrespectful? What I meant to say was, fuck you. Accent exits. I refuse to state it for you. So, one more time, we return to the differentials. The stereotype content model predicts differentiated variables. Jackson re-enters. I can see how that was disrespectful. Please accept my apology. Emergency nights. I understand. Thank you. Jackson exits. Incorporating a fundamental friend fro judgment warmth plus a capability judgment. The SCM proposes that societal groups are appraised as intending either help or harm, and as either capable or not of enacting those intentions. The model posits that the combinations of competence and warmth dimensions produce four distinct emotions towards social groups, pride, envy, pity, and disgust. Those subjects able to track the class, physical attractiveness, generational distinctions, etc. in African-American subjects tended still to respond. 
And upon my knees, I'm sorry to beat a dead horse. I really do think this is where I should. And upon my knees. So that's uh, metaphorical? Several notable conclusions. Amongst them, a direct correlation of racist stereotyping to low self-esteem, depression, and anxiety. Not only do these results beg for a more robust examination of mental health care amongst these communities broadly. And upon my knees, I charm you by my once commended beauty. And I'm still standing? Uh, okay. Okay. I I'll make it work. Can we start at the top? Is Brutus, yes. Is Brutus sick? And is it physical to walk unembraced and suck up the humors of a dank morning? What is Brutus sick? The work lays a foundation for the debunking of Western assumption that Asian Americans are immune to the destabilizing effects of institutional and societal. I do hope you're following this. Questions? Lights out. Act one, scene one. Lights rise on Valerie, leaning against the stage door wall in the back of a theater. She's on break. She wears a short leather jacket over her rehearsal skirt and corset. She speaks to her mother on the phone. Yes, I know. I, I've just been busy. I know I said I'd call earlier this week. We're on the phone now. My bad. No, I, I'm totally listening. Uh, you, you said, you just said, uh, the hydrangeas are bigger than ever this year. See, Mom, I listen. <laughs> oh my God, you're seriously going back to that? A hungry group of fellow campaign volunteers didn't judge you because I brought tuna casserole to a potluck. No, ma'am, there's no, tuna casserole carries no cultural or class implications. Seriously, I, I didn't take a watermelon. I thought we agreed not to talk about the campaign. Because of course she should vote for him. And I'll get, annoy get annoyed and <laughs> argue, so let's just not talk about it. That's ridiculous. Yes, I know. Kennedy. So it'd be okay if someone shot Hillary? So you think it to you'll make it to the show this time? Sort of a lead. Of course I've stopped. No, I know, I promised. So I don't, okay? She puts out the cigarette. Look, um, I know I said I'd stop asking, but I was hoping you could spot me just 300 to get me end to the end of the month. Yes, I know you put me through school. Yes, and graduate school, 40,000. Just a $300 loan until I get paid Friday. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, could, could I talk to Daddy, please? Valerie lights another cigarette. Daddy? Hi, it's Valerie. Scene two. Lights rise on Ginny Yang, sitting at an empty conference room table, deeply in her Blackberry. Brian enters. Oh, good, I was beginning to think I had the wrong place. Committee for the Study of Minority Matriculation, Retention, and Recruitment. Someone was very proud of that. The meeting is supposed to be here, right? 12.30, right? They changed it. When? I didn't get any... Today? Uh, I don't think so, I never got a... They didn't... Oh, they changed it to... 1.30. 1.30. Yes, I think they rescheduled so they wouldn't have to buy us lunch. Well, then you're early. Ginny's always kind of half looking or typing on her Blackberry. I'm hiding from my research assistants. Ginny doesn't look up. She's Blackberrying as though her life depends on it. Does it not strike you as strange? I'm sorry? I said, doesn't it strike you as- Strike you, I got that. Strange what? Uh, strange that if they wanted diversity institutionally, they wouldn't just hire some people of color, right? Absolutely. You didn't tell me your name. Brian. White. Jenny. Half Chinese, half Japanese. Brian White. Of course. I see how I did that. Uh, so your work? Cognitive neuroscience, when I can get to it. Recently, I've spent too much of my time teaching children. Children? 
Yes, indeed. At the leading research institution in the world, mm. I'm teaching 101 survey courses to undergrads. It's my penance. What did you do? Wait a minute. Oh my God, you're that guy. What? Your op-ed. You started that whole race firestorm. In the flesh. I should have recognized you. You're a big deal. Are you Googling me in front of me? White, the race guy. Is that your real name? Yeah, I get that a lot. <laughs> So, cognitive neuroscience. I started in neuropsych. Or maybe I could just let you. Gesturing to her still Googling, she sets the phone down sheepishly. <laughs> I started in neuropsych, detoured through biology and sociology, and sort of migrated to neuroscience, <laughs> where I stayed. Does one really migrate to neuroscience? I did. And you're Ginny Yang, psychology golden girl. I prefer Wonderkind. How do you know me? I googled you. <laughs> you weren't there. <laughs> you do Asian stereotyping. Asian American women, mostly third generation. So you know me why? I've been criticized for focusing on too narrow a demographic. I was considering broadening my parameters to be more inclusive. Dove? People other than blacks, whites, and Latinos. <laughs> so did you? Huh? Broaden your racial parameters. No. No, I didn't. Why? There are too many of you broadly Asians. No <laughs> single social experience to sing speak true, of. True, true. It was untenable. Untenable or inconvenient? Untenable. Fair enough. Have you done one of these diversity committee things before? I'm the go-to white guy for these because <laughs> I study race. And, of course, because I care. You? I generally decline. I don't know, I'm uncomfortable celebrating my marginalization with other disgruntled marginalized people. It's not my job to make the institution behave appropriately. In truth, I lost a bet with a Middle Eastern man in my department. <laughs> and I'm a toucan. Toucan? Token, toucan. I proudly represent not one, but two underrepresented populations. Underrepresented? Really? Cause I see your people everywhere. Women? The Asian people. You're mistaken. My people mostly frequent the hard sciences. As do I. I can't throw a stone without hitting a... <clears throat> My politics are such that I can make that joke with people who know me. I'll never know you well enough for that to be funny. Have dinner with me? No. I can do that better. Please, may I take you to dinner? No. You're a psychologist. <laughs> yes. Just the book kind, or do you actually shrink heads? I write books and see clients. So then you know how vulnerable a man is when asking a woman to dinner. I don't study the science of mating rituals. Not mating, just dinner. Mm. I really did like your paper. And I'm not just flattering you because I've insulted you. Repeatedly. Thank you. And again, if you knew me, may I flatter you for just another second? If you must. I like the way you write. It's smart, accessible, well-argued. It was a good read. And there was a picture of you. You photograph well. Thank you. What did your last girlfriend look like, demographically speaking? Well, I don't date demographically. Mm, humor me. Blonde, pretty, tall, sort of old money, good bone structure. Yours? Mine? Your demographic preferences in men, if you date men, and that's cool if you don't. Generally, I don't date. Can I see that? Gesturing to his iPhone, she fiddles with it. How do you... Oh, you're... Uh... That's my number. Okay, thank you. It's just my number, not a promise. I'll keep that in mind. Scene three. Light rises on Valerie sitting on a hospital gurney. She holds a bloody towel to her head. She wears a linen rehearsal corset and petticoat also covered with blood. She sits, the clock ticks, she fumes. Finally. I'm sorry I kept you waiting. Yeah, uh-huh. They didn't clean this up? No, no they didn't. Waiting room was empty and still there I sat bleeding all over myself for hours. A nurse didn't... No, no one did anything. I can tell you're angry. 
<laughs> yes. Yeah. I am very, yes. I've got a hole in my face. It's bleeding. That's a problem. This is a lot of blood. There's a lot of blood here. And this is my face. My only way out of a great deal, <sighs> a great deal of debt hinges on my face not being permanently jacked up. It's fine. Hold on. Jackson exits and enters quickly with a cart. He pulls pillows out from below. A nurse should have taken care of this. Can you lean back, please? Propping pillows behind her. There. Jackson cleans the wound. Will I get to see a doctor? I'm sorry? I get that I don't rate a freaking nurse, but might I see a doctor at some point? Dr. Jackson Moore. Oh, sorry. It happens. You don't have a name tag or white coat or anything. Will it need stitches? Yes. How many? It matters. It's my face. But the number. Will it scar? I don't know. The cab driver said five. Five what? Stitches. Oh, well, the cab driver should know. Please make them nice and small. I'm very good at stitches. It's my face. I got an A in stitches. <laughs> my face is important. I'm an actress. That's good. Huh? No, otherwise you'd be one of those weird medieval fair people. And I didn't think we did those. We? Our people. Oh, no. I'm in the show. Shakespeare. <laughs> I didn't think our people did that either. You should get out more. So, who hit you? No, no, no. I walked into a flat. I explained to the officer in the lobby. I told the woman who checked me in. I told the triage nurse. Seriously, what does a black woman have to do to convince you guys that she hasn't been beaten? Well, the triage nurse has a legal imperative. We make her ask. I, on the other hand, was just concerned. Most of the heads of pretty young women I see getting beat up got the way made by some jealous asshole. I walked into a flat. It's right there in those papers. A flat? A piece of the set. There was a jagged thing, a nail, maybe, and... Seven. It was just very dark, and I entered a run, and... Uh, and seven? Stitches. I'd guess seven, since you seem to care so much. But I promise to make them small and pretty. When I'm done, it'll be almost like you have, like, a third eyebrow, so no one even noticed the scar. That's supposed to be funny. Jackson has threaded the needle, brought a lamp close to her face, donned gloves, and is about to sew. Wait, wait, will it hurt? Of course. A lot? I numbed you up. You'll be fine, I promise. He sews. I do see theater. I saw Lord Help the Child Who Got His Mama last fall at the atrium, and um, the brothers got a song to sing. Oh, well. Yeah, see this brother, he was a gangbanger and his mama kept praying to set him straight, but he just wouldn't go right. And he accidentally shot his sister and he ended up in jail. And when he was in prison, he got saved and he found out it was really a neighborhood drug dealer that killed his sister. Yeah, and they all sang a song, went to church and uh, lived happily ever after. Uh, which play was that? Both. You're done. Eight. You said seven. Sue me. I'll send someone with paperwork, take four ibuprofen as soon as you can, and try not to walk in any more walls. Flat. You're not going to give me it. Advil? They charge an arm and a leg for those. I promise they'll cost less over the counter. I wasn't implying that your abusive, drug-dealing, pimp boyfriend wasn't a good provider. I just noticed you don't have insurance. Thanks. Some friends and I run this neighborhood clinic. It's not the Ritz, but we're good doctors. It's a better place to go for something like this. Well, we give out free birth control. Uh, no, I don't need... I wasn't... Of course not. Anyway, here's the card. I've written my number on the back. Should you have any follow-up questions about your head? You don't have to go there, but do go to a doctor and have the sutures removed in a week. Okay, thanks. Sure, thanks. Jackson exits. Valerie turns the card over. Lights fade. Scene four. Light on Brian in his office area, on phone, looking at computer. 
You're the dean, Steve. Of course this is a scold. I'm looking at it. In reference to comments made calling my attention to Article 2BG of the Teacher Student Ethics Manual, I bring in so much research money and you're sweating me over an undergrad survey course and never mind why I'm teaching an undergraduate survey course. Verbal denigrations? I did not... That's what the course is. The sociological implications of scientific methodology. Yes, I gave them an upbraiding, but I didn't call them stupid racists. Okay, I did not call them stupid. This isn't about the class. Light up on Ginny in session with a young woman. Ginny sits, clipboard in lap, glasses on. She has compassionate listening down to a science. Scenes alternate. We ended your last session with a goal, right, Akiko? You were to practice clearly stating your opinions to authority figures. And how did that go? In English, please, Akiko. I didn't kick out my students of color. I excused the ones who actually got it. Hold on, let me look it up. You're too hard on yourself. You've definitely made progress. But is what I think really important? <laughs> it's right here. Uh, Goldstein, that's Jewish, right? Biracial, really? What and what? Oh, I thought it was a Jufro. Uh, Latasha Jones. Okay, fair enough. I have 125 kids. Uh, Schwag de Gala, Jesus. Fine. Are you able to know in the moment of an interaction that you are having an opposing thought? So I sent home my three kids of color. Does it, do you not find it problematic that in a survey class of 125, there were only three? I'm hearing you say that it's what you don't say in that moment that makes you anxious. And this is tragic how? And how does that anxiety feel in your body? Steve, Steve, listen to me. All they had to do was look at the numbers and write a decent argument for an obvious conclusion. English, please. To a person, well, to a white person, they manipulated the stats to do what felt best to them. Racist is not the worst thing you can call a person. Not a person whose behavior is racist. English, Akiko. That's bullshit. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Fine, then you're racist. Are you okay? Good. I thought maybe I'd killed you with the force of my ninja-like word. Brian hangs up, regrets it, redials. Yes, a very little bit, not conversationally. Still, I want to remind you that in Japanese, a direct utterance of the word no, ie, is considered offensive. Hi, Vicky. I lost the signal. Could you put me back through to Steve, please? If I said to you, is your dress green, and clearly it is not, rather than ie, no, you would reply to kao, not quite, or maybe not. It's an example. What others might perceive as submissive or passive is simply a culturally specific way of communicating. Yeah, I'm still holding. Others, uh, the dominant culture. Yes, whites, uh, well, anyone, even second and third generation Asian Americans have embraced these values. Exactly, and so to be heard by the dominant culture, how might you state your- Sorry, Steve, lost you there. I don't think you're racist. Why the email? Clearly you're documenting do I need to worry? I'm simply trying to help you build strategies um, in awareness of certain dynamics. Do you have problems with authority? Well, sure. I, I'm sure we all humans have struggled with authority on occasion. I, I see we're out of time. Let's keep this in mind for next week. Scene five. Lights rise on Valerie in a chair facing out in Brian's lab area. She wears a new Obama t-shirt. On her forehead are now just a couple of butterfly band-aids. A complicated web of electrodes are fastened to her head. Brian, off stage, speaks into a mic. Are we almost done? The flyer said two hours. We pay for overtime. It's not that, it's just... Could you tilt your head just a bit to the right? Right, please. Sorry. And center. Great. The lights dim and a hot white light, a blank projection screen, hits Valerie. Watch the projection screen. I'll show you some random photographs. Remember, try not to think. We're monitoring your brain's immediate response to visual stimuli. So I shouldn't, like, form the words in my mind of what I'm seeing as I'm seeing it. Please just take it in, okay? Lights dim. Valerie is shown slides projected on the fourth wall. The colors play across her face. Okay. As soon as you've seen it, just say, next. Okay. Next. Next. 
next, 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 next. Uh, no, wait. I know that person. What? Where did you get these pictures? Damn it. Yeah, she's an actress. Well, that's... Harsh fluorescent lights go on. Brian enters, begins to remove electrodes through the following. Well, that's a phenomenal waste of three hours. What's the problem? She's the only one I recognize. I did a commercial with her last year. It compromises the control. We hire models, it's easier. Couldn't we just, like, not mention it? No, we couldn't, like, not mention it. Don't worry, you'll still get paid. Brian accidentally touches her band-aids. Ouch! Sorry. What happened to your head? I didn't get hit. Okay. I'm an actor, so $50 an hour for looking at pictures seems great. And it beats house cleaning. You clean houses? Yeah. What's your experiment about? Study. Fine study. We're observing neurological responses the brain has to various images. How the brain is affected by race. The most exciting developments right now derive from developments from neuroscience as much as from neuropsychology. It's phenomenal. The rigorous computational analyses of highly defined brain images. Valerie has joined Brian near the laptop. So that's a brain, okay? I look at the way each area of the brain lights up depending on what images you're shown. We monitor changes in body chemistry, pupil dilation, adrenaline levels, even the way your blood oxygenates. Pretty comprehensive. What do you want to find? I want to prove that all whites are racist. Wow. <laughs> It's kind of hot when a guy says that. You know that? Well, I guess a few women have... That people are racist. Uh, yes. My work is more complicated than that. You're a student here? Just graduated. MFA acting. So we're done? We're done. Can I put my name on a list or something so I can do more of these? I'm not sure how much you'd be called... Most of my peers don't use people of color, af, black respondents, but I can certainly make sure you're on it, the list. You're the only one who studies black people? No, I'm the only one trying to factor in blacks for control groups and also as respondents. It's a nuanced difference. Not terribly. White people are more comfortable keeping us under the microscope. Well put, but again, not me. You don't seem quite the house cleaning type. You could use someone to help you out around here. Cleaning? Sure. I could probably find some things to do for you to do. I don't know about cleaning, it makes me uncomfortable. Can you do Excel? Do you mind tedious, sorting, filing? Yeah. I need six more hours of anything a week to meet my goal. Your goal? Rent. Valerie exits. Brian watches her go. Lights fade. Scene six, the actors on phone stand, sit in different tightly lit areas. Light rises on Brian. He has dialed a conventional ring. Ginny picks up. Hello? Hi, this is Brian White calling for Ginny. Yang? Speaking. Thanks for your number. Again, why were you broadening your parameters? Good, thank you. I'm well, and how are you? So, something you said when we met, you said that you read my work to broaden your racial parameters. I also said that you're attractive. Why, if your data was productive, would you... It seemed like the right thing. Right, why? Inclusivity. Political correctness? Because some random public agenda made me feel guilty? No. Because science should leave no stone uncovered. Unturned. Beg your pardon? Nothing, sorry. So, about my previous offer. Dinner? Hoping. Hold on, let me look. Lights fade on Brian and Ginny. Ginny scrolls through her phone calendar. Light rises on Valerie dialing. The ringtone is a funky dance groove. Light up on Jackson. He's picked up. Jackson. Uh, Dr. Moore? Yes. Oh, uh, Valerie Johnston. I was in the emergency room a few days ago. You gave me your card. Uh, the bloody black girl with the weird clothes. And, well, I thought maybe I could make an appointment at your clinic. Uh, you mentioned your clinic um, to have the searchers removed. This isn't the clinic number. You wrote this number in the back of the card, so I thought. Uh, are, are you, you there? there? Yes. yes. Hold on. 
I thought... To set up an appointment, you need to call the number on the front of the card. Oh, sure. Okay. Jackson and Valerie's lights go out as Valerie hangs up abruptly. Sorry about that. Dinner? Tomorrow, six? Ugh, I have a client. Eight? Wednesday? Friday, six. Light up on Valerie, who's dialing again. No good. I have a symposium. Saturday brunch? Uh, Jackson's phone rings. Mm -mm. Dinner? Yes. Jackson? Yeah, I got that. How about The Harvest, Saturday 8? You got that? Okay. Great. Your name. I got that. This is... I just called you. Valerie. The clinic takes messages. Nikki's pretty good at getting back to you. You're serious. The receptionist should call you back. You're trying to make me feel like an asshole? Beg your pardon? Okay. You wrote your number on the back of the card. Your personal cell phone number, right? I'm not following you. The clinic's number on the front of the card. Of course, a reasonable person would know to call that number for an appointment. But I called your cell phone because you gave me the number. So... Here I am calling you, and you act like you don't remember me. No one doesn't remember me. Well, Valerie Johnson. Johnston. Well, Valerie Johnston. Had you said, I think you're a charismatic and interesting person, and I'd like to get to know you. We could have proceeded in that vein. You, however, first made reference to your need for an appointment. Do you always talk like that? Like what? You, however, first made reference to. And still my point. And still my point. I'm beginning to regret giving you the number. I'm beginning to regret calling it. I wasn't trying to make you feel like an asshole. Of course not. Okay, well, I'll call the clinic. Thanks for your help. Wait. I'll call the clinic. Valerie hangs up. Almost immediately, her phone rings. Hi, Jackson. See how I did that? Because your number pops up here on the screen, and it's the same number I just called. Despite your abundance of charm, I would like to cook you dinner. Because this went so well. Because that's what I wanted to do when I wrote my number on the back of the card. Lights out. Scene seven. Early morning at Jackson's clinic. He's on the phone with his brother and preparing for patients. He hasn't even turned the open sign around. He's hot. Mad. I told you not to call me while I'm at work. I don't have time for this. Listen. No, you listen. Fine. Yeah, it's a sickness. You're sick. Fine. No, you made your own choices. You did not trip and fall on top of a crack pipe. Good. I'm glad you're straight now. That's just great, Harold. I'm very proud of you. I just need for you to hear me clearly. You find a halfway house. You find your last crack hoe and shack up with her. You can sleep in the subway for all I fucking care, but you will not drag all this craziness into my mama's house. Ginny enters the clinic. Jackson's back faces the door. I will hurt you. I will come to mama's house and I swear to God, I will kill you. I will kill you in front of her and your boy. You bring harm to this family. You got the money I sent? Yeah. 500. Hey, Harold. Use it for food. Jackson sees Ginny. We're not open yet. I'm sorry. I, your door was... Do you need help? I called yesterday. Are you unsafe in your home? I don't think so. Are you here because someone or something is making you endangered in your home? Oh, God, no. Okay. I can show you to an examination room. Oh, no, I'm Ginny, you're Dr. Moore. Yes, there it is on your... It was nice of you to extend yourself. Uh, Nicole said to... So you read the documents, I said... You sent literature? Your nurse? No. Assistant, Nicole. Nikki? She said, uh, she said that you would have the read receptionist? the receptionist. She said that I'm you sorry, would have read I would have... To prepare for our discussion. No. Red, why? Uh, okay. 
I could walk you through it. Um, Digging through her bag, handing him a mound of papers. Uh, I spoke with Nicole on the phone. Nikki. And she, Nikki, last Wednesday. This isn't going well. So, I don't have time to make this a big thing. You can leave your samples on the counter. I'm sure someone will get back to you. We could really use XR versions of saxagliptin, whatever you have. I'm sorry? Samples. Anything diabetes? You're welcome to leave brochures. I don't understand. You didn't bring samples. I, I think you think I'm with a pharmaceutical. I'm with the study. Nikki scheduled you? With the university. The university? Harvard. Oh, of course. The university. So, what do you want? Bodies. We're not a morgue. Alive ones. Asians, specifically your Chinatown traffic for a study. We don't do studies. As a policy? Our patients aren't guinea pigs. I think you misunderstand. If you would just read the documents I sent No, her. you university people come in here all the time. We're busy here, trying to save lives. Looking around, it's a neighborhood storefront clinic. If you say so. Unless you're here to offer resources. If you could please just read the documents. <sighs> yeah, I'll be sure to do that. I, I spoke with Nikki. Maybe you could just read the documents. Yeah, it, yeah, no, I'll read them. You won't, but you should. Just, just do, please. Please. Ginny exits. Jackson throws the study into the wastebasket. Blackout. Scene eight. Valerie, on the phone outside of the theater, wears a jacket over her costume and now sports a rather impressive Grecian wig. It's getting close to the end of her break. She's on hold, looking at her watch, drawing deeply on a cigarette butt. Yes. I'm holding for Emily Rossner. I've been holding for like five minutes. Our publicist said to call at 1.15. Valerie Johnston. Julius Caesar at Shakespeare Rep. Y yes, I'll hold. I'm holding for, oh, Emily, uh, thanks for, I auditioned, um, I auditioned. How did I get to play Portia? Well, I did undergrad at, grad at Tisch, MFA at, uh, oh, okay, you have my bio. Well, there was a posting on the hotline, the equity hotline, and I scheduled an audition and I auditioned with a monologue from Lady Macbeth. You know, score your courage to, uh, oh, I haven't thought of the casting choices as brave. I guess, I mean, I'm young, but I'm told that I have a certain gravitas. And I know Portia speaks of having been Bruce's wife for some time, being older, but this is relative. She may have been 12, been like married at 12. Oh, that, okay, well, it's not really colorblind casting. I'm his wife. Well, neither are any of the actors actually Roman. <laughs> really, it's it's really just me, an Asian spirit carrier and a Croatian Gaius Trebonius. Conrad's a traditionalist. Takes place where it would have taken place realistic design elements. I'm very excited to make my professional debut at Boston Six. Uh, okay then, um, thank you for your time. Uh, if you have any more questions, feel free to... The reporter has hung up. Scene 9. Brian and Jackson sit on a bench in a gym locker room. They've been playing basketball. Both are sweaty and winded. Wait, wait. What did you say she said? It wasn't even what she said. It was, it was how she said it. It was tone. Tone like, like you should be so lucky. Like coming off of her in waves. That shit's hot. What? Yeah, generally, if you should be so lucky as coming off a girl, it means you should be so lucky. I'm just off my game. You're off your game. That's funny. I don't know if you could be off it if you wasn't ever on it. I've been on it. Jackson has wiped himself down with a towel. Through the following, he's put bottled water on a towel and wiped at his armpits, spraying an aerosol deodorant under his arms, then for good measure, everywhere. Brian watches. You're going back to work like that. I have a date. You're not gonna shower? 
I don't want to wash off my pheromones. So, why are you off your game? I meant at work. The department, something's shifting. They're fucking with my money, pulling back my research assistance. But you're the man, right? Aren't you like their golden boy or something? What'd you do? I'm not like you. I don't do things. I called a room full of undergrads racist. Then I called my dean racist. I may have intimated that the institution is racist in an op-ed and on NPR. That's funny. But only the, to the degree that all historically white institutions are. Oh, so professionally you're almost as self-destructive as I am. Okay, I'm liking this. Oh no, what did you do now? Oh, I cut off a fat old man's toe, then quit, then begged for my job back. You did what? Oh no, 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 no. You're the one who fucked up and... <clears throat> what happened? They've been throwing money at me to say this stuff for years, you know that. Only now that my numbers are coming in like I knew they would, and I can back it up, it's as though they're hearing it for the first time. Right? They pump you up, you the man, then as soon as you take a little initiative, boom. Three months nighttime rotations. So, listen, they've invited me to do this lecture kind of out of nowhere. Making you sing for your supper. Or atone for my sins. I'm definitely being asked to supplicate, but I don't know to whom and I don't know for what reason. Anyway, I, uh, <clears throat> I wondered if you could come. Sure, if I'm not working. Text me the info. So, uh, you think you're gonna tap that ass? I don't tap ass. I make sweet, sweet love to a woman. Yeah, once every five years. <laughs> Fuck you. Jackson is dressed, zipped up his gym bag, and is about to leave. Pheromones. Scene 10. Light up on Ginny on a small raised platform. Shopping bags are draped over her shoulders. Henri Bendel, Saks, Barney's. No, no. She gave me the coupon last week. I spent $375 and the sales girl gave me... Hold on. Ginny juggles her bags, digging through her purse for her wallet. Here, look, here's the receipt. Who? I don't know her name. I come in here regularly and spend enough money that on the rare occasion I'm given a coupon and I'm told that I will be able to redeem said coupon. I expect the common courtesy of... Yes, it does say that it's expired, but I didn't look at it. I was told that it would be honored. I could have used it then, but I ordered the skirt, the skirt that you didn't have in my size, and I was told that you would honor this. Can you back up, please? Thank you. So, I can just leave this here, but wouldn't you really rather have the commission than quibble with me over, let's see, what would that be? 10% uh, of 250, what is that, like $25? See the big picture. You'd lose a regular customer and commission over the $25 you think you're saving a company that doesn't give you benefits. Thank you. Visa. Scene 11. In the dark, the muffled guttural sounds of final moments of climactic lovemaking. Lights rise on Jackson and Valerie untangling themselves from the couch. Jackson's pants around one leg, Valerie adjusting her skirt and pulling her panties up. An unbearably long moment of fumbling. Finally. I'm sorry. I, I lost my train of thought. Where was I? House cleaning. All right. House cleaning. Well, I used to make about 15 an hour, but now my rates are as high as 35. You just go in and you do an amazing job. Little tricks. Uh, wash the windows, the light bulbs. It just sparkles. And they don't know why. On the fourth week, you tell them that you're sorry, but you realize you're overbooked. Usually, you'll get a raise right then and there. If they don't, they'll call you two weeks later <laughs> and say, name your price. And I say, well, if I squeeze you in on Tuesday mornings, I'd have to give up a job that pays 25 an hour. And there it is. They kiss. I've never done this before. Really? On a first date. Technically mid-first date. Really, and I'm not just saying that. I'm a fourth date girl. So arbitrary. I know, right? I made a peach cobbler if you'd like dessert. Okay. What felt like cable TV passion has just turned into the heights of weirdness. He tries to pour more wine. Bottles empty. I could get more, 
but we'd have to switch to red. Unless you want more, uh, but I'm, I'm good. If you're sure. Have a nice mouth, Beck. Did your mama teach you how to fry fish like that? My grandmama. She's from Virginia. Ah, uh, that's why greens, cornbread, catfish, and a peach cobbler. <laughs> how do you eat like that and stay so... Well, it was delicious. Thank you. I figured you liked it after your third piece. Two. Three. I counted. There's nothing hotter than a woman with an appetite. I'm impressed and a little surprised you handle a hot sauce bottle so well. What are you saying? Now, the real test was when you asked for vinegar for your greens. That's just downright sexy and just a little hood. Uh, I don't know what that means. No, just, uh... You were testing me. Whoa, don't get touchy. You purposely didn't put the hot sauce on the table to see if I would ask for it. No. So you just wouldn't expect me to use condiments if I wasn't how you say down. I mean, you're a little sedity, but I wouldn't have presumed to know your relationship with hot sauce or vinegar. Malvik, please. Jackson exits to get wine. Valerie makes half-hearted attempts to restore herself to her original first date unrumpledness. Lights up on Ginny and Brian in a restaurant. And then he said, Professor White, I just couldn't bring myself to hand in anything beneath my own standards. No. Really. And I said, well, that's late. And he proceeds to explain that he is not only a straight A student, but he was third in his class at Exeter. And I said, well, this is college. Maybe if you'd cared less about standards and more about deadlines, you'd have been first. And he says, no disrespect intended, Dr. White, but that's utterly out of line. Utterly? Wait, wait, there's more. He asked me where I went to school. And when I said undergrad Cornell, master's and first doctor at Princeton, second doctor at Harvard, he said, no, no, high school. Oh my God. And explained that third in a class at Exeter would have been amongst the first in any public school and most private schools in the country. <laughs> That's ridiculous. So I said, when I went to public high school, they had a name for young men like you. Asshole. Right. Asshole. I miss undergrads. They're cute. So you don't teach at all? Occasionally a graduate seminar. Mostly they leave me to my research. I went to Michigan undergrad. Well, that's okay. I wasn't embarrassed, just sharing. Of course. Brian takes a sip of wine. Back to Val and Jackson. He's pouring the wine. Truce, please. I cooked. You know, to a Sididi girl, Sididi's like fighting words. I'm sorry. <laughs> when we were kids, my cousins in Detroit called me Sididi, but they wouldn't beat me up. They were industrious and would take me out to meet their friends and I'd end up getting my proper talk and she thinks she white ass beat every time. They set you up. Of course they did. And I never saw it coming. It's a nice name you have. It was supposed to be presidential. You must have been a great disappointment. No, nah, my mom's very proud. I told her I'd be a surgeon when I was in the fourth grade, so I applied myself. You? A great disappointment. Hugely disappointing. But they made their bed. They used to take me all the time to these cultural things, the ballet, the orchestra, plays, not for their undying love of art, but because they wanted me to be someone who could get into an Ivy League and graduate and make money. So there's tension. It'll be okay when I marry a rich doctor and stop this starving artist thing. Uh, I just realized I have so much work tomorrow. Uh, we should call it a night. You didn't just... No, I didn't. I'm sorry. You're offended. You dismissed me. Uh, I said one stupid thing. You're supposed to just not call me back, not end the date abruptly, especially after. No, really. I'm tired. Curtain just came down. I've been on night shifts in an emergency and then going directly to my clinic. <laughs> it's fine. And I'm still not getting the house clean thing. You don't have to. 
well, you're smart. Seems like your energies could go to something more productive. I'm an actor. Why? Because it's what I do better than anyone else can. It's my contribution. You don't think the housekeeping thing sets us back a little? I mean, my grandmama and my mom cleaned houses so that I could, you know, go to medical school and make something of my family. Not to help people. Say what? You went to med school to help people, yes. And your deaf portrayal of Portia empowers our people how? I volunteer for Obama. I take bullets out of gangbangers. <sighs> What's wrong with you? I've just never met someone so incredibly well insulated. It's like I campaign and volunteer for Obama as your whole black card. <laughs> you didn't ask me for my black card before you... You didn't tell me you spread your regs prematurely because I'm a doctor. So thank you for dinner. I can walk you to your car. No, no, I'm good. Uh, thank you. Actually, where's the bathroom? Valerie exits to bathroom. Brian and Ginny, same date, later. You can't even imagine how few people in psych were studying Asian American anything 10 years ago. There was a hole, so I decided to fill it. You? I try to fill holes whenever I can. You came to this work, why? I'm not sure. You've had a squirrel or something trapped in a wall or vent or something, yeah? You know, it, at first it's this sort of non-localized smell, just unpleasant around the edges. It's nagging, and maybe you just need to take out the garbage or put a lemon in the disposal. So you do, and then you run to whatever meeting or class you're late to. A little later, you notice it again. It's faint, and maybe you're imagining it. You spray a little for breeze, go about your business. Then one day you get home, and it's just foul, putrid, and you know that something has died in the fucking wall. That's a good metaphor. I hadn't made it yet. Yeah, I know, but I get it. Racism. You're really going to have to stop doing that. My point, I'm not being altruistic. It smells and I live here. In neuropsych, all I could do is point it out, like you do. I don't just, I address it in my research with my clients. Anyway, I did five more years because I wanted the tools to nail that shit down. It's a lot of argument to get your head around. Seriously, like trying to work out the space-time continuum in a summer movie. There's always a valid other argument but I figured it out, and I'm right, and the university's fucking with me. Is it possible you look at it all through too narrow a lens? Explain. So the work I do. Perhaps it's given more room because I'm not railing against the system that created the circumstances. By circumstances, you mean genocide, slavery, internment. Look, I've, I've identified issues in specific Asian populations, depression, anxiety. I've acknowledged the unfair social Dynamic. Racism. Do you not get tired of that word? I've pointed out the dynamic that feeds the cycle, but I address the cycle. What good does running around screaming slavery and internment do now? What about the white individuals who made the bullshit that makes the low self-esteem? <laughs> I'm more concerned with the female Asian American individuals who are just trying to get jobs, date, have decent family lives. It is what it is. Why not just give people a better set of tools for navigating it? So, who do you date, demographically? I told you, I don't date. I just sleep around. But because I'm a slut, not because I'm Asian. Then why are we wasting time with all of this chit-chat? Your earnestness and dogged determination appeal to me somehow. And I like that you're a slutty accommodationist. Back at Jackson's, Valerie's gathering her things, putting on her coat. I can make you a plate to take with you. I'm sorry, I just, I have a question. Do guys like you come on to girls like me just to you know, punish us? I told you, it's been a long day. Seriously, what did I do to you? So, here's what I do. I'm a surgeon. I've been studying to be a surgeon for the last eight years. That's not including all the pre-meds in college. And I did well, straight A's. It seems I have a natural proclivity for just about anything I do. You know, a residency, it's a hazing, an endurance test. They put us on these crazy hours in emergency. It's just barfing, blood, crying babies, and boys trying to kill themselves via one another. We're supposed to pay our dues for a couple of years, then follow around a real surgeon who's supposed to teach me, except they don't like me. We don't need to spend time deconstructing why the black guy can't get a decent mentor in Boston. In America. 
It's not just Boston. Yeah, okay. So every now and then, I don't feel like being like treated like Sambo that day, and I push back just a little. So today I say, no, when I wrote that thing about that patient on that chart there you're holding, it's because I knew what I was doing. And when that nurse came up behind me and called doctor whoever the fuck to come in behind me and second guess me, and he decided because I'm so stucky and arbitrarily prescribed some kind of bullshit course of action, and now the patient's worse, you will not pin that on me. So then it doesn't matter how I say it, I'm angry and volatile and not good at working with others. So I get written up and have to do the whole fucking bedpan thing again. So today I went to work in the emergency room for 10 hours. Then I went to my clinic and worked six because someone has to take care of those people. And then I made your ass dinner and you're tripping because I tease you about some hot sauce. I don't have time for that. So the takeaway is you ask a woman over and treat her like shit because you had a bad day at the office. <laughs> I'm really glad you cleared that up. Scene 12. Light up on Ginny in a different area. She faces the audience, several shopping bags around her feet. She digs through her wallet. But I called earlier today. You were holding a blouse, like the one in the window. Yang, Ginny Yang. A blue silk petite too. Well, can you send someone onto the floor to check? Uh, while she's looking, if I, um, if I make a catalog purchase and have it shipped directly to the store, I don't have to pay shipping charges, correct? Ginny's phone is rung. The call is from a client. She's staking it. Uh, excuse me, could you? I, I just have to. Stepping away from the counter. Hello, Dr. Yang. Uh, I'm sorry, this is... Are you in crisis? Have you hurt yourself? Good, I will meet you at the hospital. Uh, listen to me. You are okay. You have done your work, Akiko. You, you have a lifetime of pain that you are just acknowledging and it is frightening, overwhelming. But this is a breakthrough and I am very proud of you and I am here for you. Do you have a friend or neighbor who can drive you? Good, go to Mass General, ask for psych. I'll meet you there. Rem remember to breathe. Inhale three, hold three, exhale five. Two, three, hold. Two, three, two, three, four, five. I will see you soon. She hangs up and returns to the sales counter. The other sales associate has returned. The dress was not on the floor. So it's not there? Then surely you can take it off the mannequin, please. No, no, it wasn't a question. Please have her take it off the mannequin. Thank you. No worries. Why would I worry? I just like my blouse. Thank you. Uh, cash. Scene 13. Light rises on Valerie auditioning for a role reading from the script. She's at the climax of ghetto passion, to table of auditors, bag on shoulder. Hi, I'm Valerie Johnston, and I'll be reading for Shalanda. Um, I left my headshot with the monitor, uh, but if you need one, I... Okay, then. I was loving you, Lenny. All that time you was looking at me and I thought you was looking into my soul. And uh, you wasn't seeing me at all. And I was looking at you and I knowed you seed something. Uh, I knowed there's a man in there and I could see him even if you couldn't. And mama said, she said, no nah, girl, he don't love you. He only love you long as you give him what he need. Stay scared and stay under his foot. And I told, Atoll. Atoll? Uh, I told her. I told her. I told. Oh, okay. I told her. Okay. And I told her she was wrong. And I told her. Uh, I got it. Uh, sorry. Uh, where should I begin? Uh, no, I can just. I can start over. I'm so sorry. Uh, my agent didn't send the right sides. So I'm reading this cold. Uh, I was told to prepare for Mary, uh, the social worker. Oh, I seemed a better fit for this role. 
so my agent didn't tell you did tell you that I have a call at two. I, I'm doing enemy of the people at the sure thing from the top then. I was loving you, Lenny. All the time you was looking at me and I thought you was looking into my soul. And I, oh, okay, sure. Thank you. Scene 14. Brian stands before a small audience in a small lecture hall. He is dressed more formally than we've ever seen him. His demeanor, slightly more nervous, somewhat more impassioned. This is his swan song. I'd first like to thank the Institute for having me. And I have the pleasure of having in the audience two of my deans, Dean Jankowski, Dean Thompson. I won't begin to name the rest of you. I surely could only get in trouble that way. But suffice it to say, there's, it's wonderful to see so many of you from so many disciplines. No pressure. <clears throat> I will just dive in then. Turning to his paper, established slide of dolls from Clark's study, then projected. Families of various ethnicities comprised of various numbers of children, or not, some blended families, some same gendered couples. Our understanding of prejudice has largely been characterized as simple animosity born of fear and ignorance. We have subscribed relatively narrow parameters to the phenomenon of prejudice. Evidence for this can be found in bipolar attitude scales like dislike that measure prejudice. A complicated scale appears on the small projection screen behind Brian economists, and even more complicated chart littered with numbers and arrows, sociologists and psychologists, a black and white photograph of three white dolls and three black dolls lying on their backs in a row. We've seen this. He turns the screen off. There was a time when I would have attributed your eyes rolling up into the backs of your heads as a direct correlate to my inability to grab you and hold you. I would have said, it's the words, how the words racism, prejudice, discrimination, always throw us into a, a collective tailspin, a downward spiral of defensiveness, embarrassment, animosity, inadequacy, or rage. I get that, I understand that. Honestly, I almost don't resent that, but just listen, please. So what are we to do? How then to approach the explaining of that which both defies and begs explanation? You, my peers and superiors from the hard sciences, would say, don't. We are not here to explain. We're here to present. God forbid something as subjective as race touch our precious findings. So the data collective sits there. Years and years and hundreds of thousands of dollars spent gathering and aggregating, and it sits there while we bullshit around it. God forbid we're the white people saying the wrong thing. Let's face it. You're afraid that government interests and the big money donors you're in bed with will pull your resources. It's unconscionable, tragic really, your silencing of the truth. This dynamic has held our country hostage since its inception and you would rather we not look at it? Well, I say grow a pair. Suck it the fuck up. The level of aggressive passivity in this room, in these vocations, in this country is shameful. Roll up your sleeves and wade through the muck. We must look at the scientific evidence and embrace that we, the white people, are implicated. Look, numbers, numbers, more numbers. What's that? Numbers, cold, hard data. I'm speaking your language. I've proven that it's there in our brains, in our cells, in our fucking blood, a predisposition to hate. We are programmed to distrust and fear those with more melanin. We're not defective. We just must understand our brains, accept our physiology, and acknowledge the social reality that we so virulently deny. God damn it, we are scientists. And so bear the burden of enlightenment and reason. Don't we? Fine then. Turns the projector back on, fast forwards past families to charts and graphs. So we'll turn to the stereotype content model. Rosen and Gardner predicts differentiated prejudices between lights and projections go out abruptly. End of act one.
Act Two. Scene One. Jackson and Brian sit on a bench. They've just finished an intense basketball one-on-one. -on -one. Both are soaked. Brian is exhausted. Tell me again. So why did you invite me? I told you. Maybe we could just talk about how I kicked ass on the court. Not once, not once, but twice. See, white man can jump. <laughs> Obviously, I was off my game. I thought your people could use that shit, like turn it into anger and burn up the court or something. My people? You can't channel years of oppression and beat one middle-aged white guy? I let you win. Seriously, though, your shit fucked me up. I guess I just needed a friendly face. No, you needed your work colleagues to see your black friend not be offended by your weird work. That's why I didn't want to just hand you the paper to read. So this is what all the hubbub's about, and now they're going to decide your fate. Pretty much. How have you been talking around the heart of your work for all these years? I thought you were an advocate, you know, just acknowledging the presence of a social phenomenon, that innocuous shit you pseudoscience people like to do. Your numbers are straight. Yeah. The lab work checks out. Of course. Damn. I know. I'm not surprised. I was. <laughs> of course you were. You're white. But I'm evolved. If you're so evolved, why were you surprised? Seriously, every time a white person acts like you'd expect a white person to act, well, like I'd expect a white person to act, a lot of white people at first are like, I don't believe it. It didn't happen. You must have heard it wrong. Then, oh, I'm shocked. And then, get over it, black people. It's not that big a deal. Obama's running for president. And you've got Tiger Woods and Michael Jordan. Come on, I've got the court reserved for another hour. Jackson has tied his shoes and wiped off his face. He's ready to play. You should take a moment to enjoy the glory of victory because I'm about to beat your ass. There's the anger you were supposed to channel into your game. So you've proven that whites have an issue with race. They do. A revelation. Well, that's not the revelation. I know that. We have to be able to see it, right? Someone has to say conclusively, irrefutably, that it's there before things can get better. You're a man of science. I sort of thought you'd celebrate my genius. You want me to celebrate your genius? How about I celebrate my victory when I beat your sorry white ass? Coming. Jackson tosses the ball to Brian. He walks onto the court. Brian doesn't follow. I thought we were playing. I can't believe you really have a problem with- Let's drop it. Well, just answer me. What? Do you have a problem with my work? That's stupid. How am I going to have a problem with your work? With the study. Come on, man. Nah, it's cool. We still all right? It's all cool. Okay, what is this? You got to let this shit go, man. We cool. Let's leave it. What is this, we cool? Who did you just turn into? Just say what's on your mind. Please. Jackson takes a long drink, screws the cap on, and wipes his mouth with a shirt. It's just the preliminary study, right? Yeah, the hard conclusions aren't in yet. And your whole thing is you're going to prove to whites that they're racist. Well, I don't say racist. I'm sure you do. Well, on the radio, but not in my study. Also a problem. But it's there, so... But you're saying... But, yeah, okay. So the lead on the Today Show will say, Harvard study proves whites are biologically racist. I don't know, man. That's a dangerous soundbite. I'm not even sure if it's relevant. Sure it is. Legislation is made on statistics and scientific proof. Yeah, uh, you know who is in the mixing of race, biology, and legislation? The Nazis. You're calling me Mengele. Of course not. But it got your attention. This is the time. Politically, we're poised... If he wins. And he couldn't possibly. It's America. They did those studies, right? The Clark study? They used to push for integration? The little black, black dolls and little white dolls, and they showed the little black girls and little white girls, little white doll, right? And then they showed them the black doll, and they asked them which was prettier, and they all said the little white doll, right? That's psychologists and sociologists. I'm exposing it at an indisputable neurological level so that- All I'm saying is- I'm talking, I'm talking now. I'm listening. No, you're not. I'm just saying- Shut up and let me finish. Jesus. Until they see it, the brain scans, the blood work, the proof, there's room to think the worst. 
what would the worst be? I'm not following you. So back to the Clark study. Our conclusion, right? Our liberal-minded conclusion is the children are repulsed by the black dolls because of a certain beauty standard, right? A cultural validation. For the black girls, it's supposed to be internalized oppression, right? But now, just pretend we're not well-intentioned and liberal, okay? What else might the conclusion suggest? That the black doll is ugly. I'm just showing what's already in the brain. The study doesn't stand up. And I'm a real doctor who makes people well. That's and low. Almost a brain surgeon. Almost. So with all my education, I'm not getting how just because you see a grown brain react in a certain way or someone sweats or blinks or their blood is more highly oxygenated, how you surmise that that's cellular. Why wouldn't that just prove how early and effectively a racist society imprints? Well, that's true if the majority of white Americans didn't swear they didn't have a racist thought in their heads. That's the lie. White Americans. You're looking at the white Americans who shop at Whole Foods and care about their ecological footprints and teach their babies sign language. Blue blood or working class, all the same brain patterns. All I'm trying to do is prove that it's there. It's what white supremacy is predicated upon. I'm saying even the most liberal minded white person thinks subconsciously, deep down, past where we've been programmed not to say it, truly feels that the black doll actually is not only ugly, but wants to kill our children. It's not enough. It's my part. It's your part or your ticket to tenure. Isn't what makes us human supposed to be our ability to subvert our impulses, our genetically driven impulses, so don't, we don't walk around fucking all the attractive ladies? You do. Well, shouldn't this study on which you've based your professional reputation be about more than that? And where's the part about what the black people think? Hmm? Did it not occur to you that we might have less than ambivalent feelings when presented with scary images of white people? I wanted to work on that. You wanted to? Well, that's next. I use blacks mostly for control groups now. Phase two is flipping it. You think this is a powder keg. That's bullshit. You better get on phase two. Such a trailblazer. Then figure out that shit and then get back to me about the DNA of racist white people. You're really bothered by this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so is everyone. They put their towels and clothes into their sports bags. Did you really let me win both games? Look at me. He's a beautiful specimen of athletic black manliness. What do you think? Lights fade on Brian and Jackson. Scene two, inside of Jackson's clinic day. Valerie stands at the front desk. She waits for a receptionist. Ginny busts in, obviously in a hurry, expecting to do another Jackson study drive-by. She's surprised he's not there. An awkward moment or two, finally. So, uh, is Dr. Moore here? I, I don't know. I just got here. I don't think anyone- I brought these papers for him. She thrust the study into Valerie's hands. Oh, I'm not- We spoke on the phone. No. Maybe you could put in a good word for me, get him to just look at it. I'm sorry? I, I don't think it's open. The door was- unlocked but i don't see uh, so he's told you about me i'm really not the pain in the ass i'm sure he'd have you think nicole nikki valerie no Ginny. well thank you nikki if you could just give him that Ginny exits valerie puts the papers on the counter hello valerie is about to exit when Jackson comes in from the back with lunch in a greasy bag, something unhealthy from the neighborhood. It was open? I guess so. I just ran to get my- There was someone here for you, a short Asian woman. That's every other person in this neighborhood. I've been thinking about, you know, something you said the other night about helping our people or something. And first I was like, who the fuck does he think he is? And then I was like, who the fuck does he think he is? But what do I do to further whatever? And then I was like, fuck you. Task me to justify myself for being an artist. You know, I really kind of liked you. I did. It's not very often you meet someone, anyone who's smart and funny and quick 
I like quick. And you push back a little. And that's nice. To a point. I really liked you. That you're black and handsome and articulate. You like that I'm black and articulate? There were quotes around articulate. I'm a good girl. I'm the girl who went to church and kept my virginity until junior year of college and felt guilty about it after. I'm the girl that pretty much anything I do or say is just because, you know, like I'm earnest and honest. And I was never the girl who knows what not to say and how to be disinterested enough to get the guys like you. I'm not slick and I say the wrong things. You couldn't just call. Okay, then. Valerie exits. Jackson picks up the study Ginny has left and exits with it as lights fade out. Scene three. Light rises on Ginny in session. In English, please, Akiko. Would you like a tissue? Uh, okay. Mm, that, that must be very difficult for you. You've never had your marginalization named. Uh, marginalized, made to feel small, made to feel outside. Oh, you've never been marginalized because you consider yourself white. I didn't. Okay, well, identity is subjective. I'm not sure what I think matters. Is it important to you that I agree? No. No, I wonder only why you might have chosen me. Do you think of me as white? <laughs> identity is tricky. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you just want respect. And what would that look like? Lights up on Valerie sitting on the floor in Brian's lab. She sorts and stacks five by seven cards. She makes stacks of different categories on the floor, placing each card in its own pile as she sorts. The sound of her putting the cards on the floor is audible like a loud game of cards. Brian works on his computer. White, 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 Asian. White, African American, white, white, white. Do you have to do that out loud? White, 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 white. Um, so it's complicated. We've talked about this before, Akiko. Yes, I strongly identify as Asian American, but that is my choice. No. No, I wonder only why you might have chosen me, though. White, white, white. African American, other, white, other, Latino, African American, African American, other, whose other feet don't use Asians? Native American, biracial, African Caribbean, Middle Eastern, some Jews don't like to mark white. Seems like you'd rather be something than other. I see, you think of me as white. Identity is tricky. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, it's complicated. So yes, again, I strongly identify as Asian American, but that is my choice. It is not necessary that we identify similarly. We're set then for the same time next week? Great. Consider my question though. What would make you feel seen? Light out on Ginny. Don't you have grad students who could do this? No. Val. It is not economically efficient for me to pay you to not let me work. Sorry. You said you would canvas with me this weekend. Yeah, I got buried here. Well, you can imagine how much fun New Hampshire was for me. Do you even want him to win? Do they brainwash you guys down there at headquarters? It won't happen without every- Valerie, it won't happen. And I don't know why you're doing this work. I'm not, because you won't stop talking. Valerie goes back to her sorting. She picks up a new stack. Wait, 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 other, wait. Do you keep track of the race of the person surveying? Why? Obviously, this stack belongs to a white person. Valerie, why are you fucking with me today? I read your study. <sighs> you too. It scared me. Can I tell you why? Yeah. 
Sure, I'm happy for you to have an opinion about that which you know nothing. It's great that you feel empowered to weigh in on this work I've been doing for decades because your skin is brown. I get it all the time. Do you know blacks in the med school co coalesced with blacks in AFAM and anthropology to petition me to stop my work? Why? Because the mingling of science and race could prove damaging. You're here now because when my department got pushed back, I lost my funding and they pulled my research assistance. They're shaming me into leaving. You think it's hard studying black? Try being black. Of course I get that. I'm just tired of having to say I get that all the time. Brian looks at Valerie, turns silently, and goes back to his computer, slightly defeated, highly frustrated. Valerie stares. Finally, she begins picking up the cards, stacking them neatly in a box. After too long of this, Brian crosses to Valerie, sits next to her. Listen, Val. I'm just a white guy who wanted to know what it meant in my brain to be a white guy. I just wanted to compare what your crazy public minister people are always screaming about with what's happening in my head. And when I started to look into the heads of people who look like me, even I was shocked. So then I wanted to know what people who looked like you saw when they see the things that I see. And that we see two different worlds is blowing my mind. It's it's E equals MC squared. It's Darwin and Galileo and Newton and Copernicus. And what do I get? Shut down by someone like you? What the hell do black anthropologists and economists know about science? What do you know about science? Life is so hard for you? Why? You're beautiful? You clean houses because you think it's cute and it pisses off your mother? And you're going to criticize me for trying to make tangible that which your people are accused of making up? It's more complicated. I'm sure it is. It's complicated. Valerie reaches out and touches Brian's face. It startles them both. They cover, he covers her hand with his. The moment is almost more than a mutual agreement to let it pass. Light fades. Valerie continues sorting as Brian returns to the globe as computer. The sound of typing accompanies. Wait, wait, wait. White, other, white, white, white. Hey, Brian. What? I do believe I heard you call me pretty. I said beautiful. The glow of Brian's computer is the last thing we see. Scene four. Ginny rushes up as Jackson is pulling the curtain closed on an emergency room, much like the one he met Valerie in. Ginny almost bumps into him, not yet seeing him. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking for a patient. Um, Hayashida, Akiko Hayashida. Patient? Uh, the front desk told me, um, it's you. You have patients here? We met at your clinic, Jenny Yang. I have a very good memory, but do you have patients here? I try not to. I got a call from Psych that a client of mine is- You're a doctor. If you read my study, the proposal, you know what, I just need to find Akiko. They took her up to Psych. It'll take him a while to check her in. She's fine, superficial wounds. She just wanted attention. Well, she got it. This is her second time here. Wait, please. I did read your study. You wouldn't give up. Then you know I'm a real doctor. Well, I didn't realize you were gonna be providing free counseling. You didn't give me a chance to tell you. I was busy saving lives. So, who's doing the head shrinking? Counseling, it, it matters why. I don't want a bunch of 24-year-old white girls brushing up on their psychiatric doctoring skills on my patients. I'll do it. Okay, Dan. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, then. Jackson exits. Ginny watches, then heads off in another direction. Scene five. Valerie wears an Obama hat, jacket, and t-shirt. She holds a clipboard and a stack of brochures. She stands in a very tight square light. She's waiting for someone to answer the door. When the door's open, the quality of light changes. Good afternoon. My name is Valerie Johnston. The door is slammed shut. Another square of light appears. She goes to it. Hello. My name is Valerie Johnston, and I wondered if you're registered to vote and wanted to tell you a bit about my candidate, Barack Obama. The door is slammed. Another light. I wondered if you're registered to vote. My candidate, Barack. The door is slammed. Another light. Hi, I'm Valerie Johnston. Yes, Obama. 
It's nice that you're volunteering your time. Thank you. You have no idea how mean people can be. Oh, I do. Right. Uh, well, you know, change doesn't happen unless we all can Where were stand. you when Hillary needed your support? I'm sorry? Did you canvas for Hillary? Um, I'm sure Hillary could be a fine leader, but, uh, well, she's, she's not my candidate. Uh, yes, I am a feminist, uh, but she's not my candidate. Uh, the first woman president would be, like, incredible, as would the first... So I'm guessing you don't need brochures. Well, it's not, it's really not about gender or race. He's the best candidate. Yes, I am deeply aware of gender disparity, but some of us have, you know what? Why don't you spare us both and just slam the door in my face? The door slams. Lights out. Scene six. Ginny sits on the edge of the bed barefoot, buttoning up her blouse. Brian has entered in pajama bottoms with a glass of water for Ginny. I bought out of all my classes for the fall. <laughs> You're beautiful. But this spring, I'm teaching one, which will kill me. I'll never make my deadlines. I've got two book deadlines, a journal review, and I'm supposed to be presenting at ASI next month. I just want to point out that this, this is really sexy. This post-coital banter of yours. I'm sorry. It was really nice. You should know about me that I've been criticized for being unnurturing. Are you? Unnurturing is for babies and plants. That's hot. <laughs> he kisses her, eases her back down onto the bed. It seems that the shirt might be coming off. Shirt is not coming off. I really gotta go or I won't be any good tomorrow. Uh, okay. You're the youngest tenured person in the universe. Why can't you stay with your boyfriend for one night? Oh, I work harder because I have tenure. Boyfriend? Really? Already? Okay, sure, I guess. Uh, seriously, tenure just turned up the pressure. Why? I don't know. I have to prove that I deserve it. Prove? What do you want me to say? I guess I thought maybe you'd say you work so hard for the girls. Yeah, what girls? The girls you study? The girls you counsel? I counsel women. I'm just saying... All the hoops you jump through, and you have it. You have everything. Why keep jumping? Just sit still in the success for a second. Sit still? I'm just trying to give perspective. Why don't you stay over? I don't do that. I won't give you a key. You can take your toothbrush with you. I just thought maybe we could, you know, talk some sexy data analysis, go another round, and then spoon? I don't spoon. I don't even use that word. Why are you here? You're the first man I've met lately that doesn't seem deeply infected with yellow fever. You're attractive, seem to be passionate about doing good in the world, and you're the smartest person I know who isn't me. But I really do have to go. She puts on her shoes, begins to gather her things through the following. No, no, you cannot go. It's 1145. If you do not go home and work, the world will not end. <laughs> I just gave you great sex, decent conversation. You're such a leech. I gave you great sex. I concede that. What is this thing that you do? I'm going. Well, just talk to me. Don't go home and order a new pair of shoes. Yeah, yeah, I see you. That's an abnormal <laughs> amount of shopping that you do. That, my dear, is a problem. Oh, we're talking about my shopping habits because I, because I wouldn't stay in Spoon? We're talking about your shopping habits because I think you think you're perfect and you're uh, not. You're jealous. I'm horny. I have to go. I have work to do. I'm sorry. That was uncalled for. I just, it would be nice to make enough money to one day support your shopping addiction. Forgive me for sounding like a Neanderthal. My mother was a feminist. She phrased me better than this. But, but listen, I want to take care of you a little bit. I want for you to, to know that I've got you. Stop proving and just lean into me for a second. Relax into me. Relax? Relax into you. Are you kidding me? I have to show up and represent. Do you know how many people are lined up behind me to take that shit away? You're supposed to know that. But you don't because it's untenable. I've always understood that. How would you not know that I've always understood that? It's it's what my career is bit on, built on. It's what I do. You know that. So what? You won an award. Yes. 
Why should I not want an award? That's good business. That's access to people and money. That's influence. That's legislation. Yeah, I want a Balzan and a Templeton. And yes, I want a Genius Grant too. It's not even called that anymore. I want a Genius Grant. A Genius Grant will not make your dick longer. I don't know why I said that. I like your dick. Your dick is long enough. I want a Genius Grant. I don't think you do. People around you get weird. Hostile sometimes, almost. My mother actually said, oh, she's such a genius, but she can't find a man and give me grandchildren. I went out with this guy who after sex turned to me and said, so that's what a power fuck feels like. I was doing my work for the girls, as you say, and the more white men said, good job, the further away I got from what I thought I was doing. Praise is insidious and seductive and I hate it. So you don't talk to me about what you don't know. Just sit there in the want of it, but shut up about what you don't have. You love it. You love the power. What is wrong with you? <laughs> I'm just saying, who does a person have to fuck to get a genius grant around here? Okay. Okay. I like a white man, longa, longa penis. It very, how do you say it? Very, very please me. Ginny pushes Brian onto the edge of the bed, kneels in front of him. It is disturbing. It should be. She has unzipped his pants. It takes him a moment to understand what's happening. What? Stop. Why you no hard? I not please. Jenny. I make a white man feel good, and a feel good, and a feel good. Ginny, back to audience, begins to fillet him. So, you tell Ginny if I know, please. In darkness, we hear Brian enjoying it despite himself. Lights out. Scene seven, night. Jackson stands next to a back alley stage door. Valerie enters. Truly magnificent. I wouldn't have ex expected you to come. You sent me an email. I sent everyone in my address but an email. You're luminous. I don't really understand you. Really, I like to play a lot, but every time you walked out there, the whole stage lit up. Thank you. I'm sorry I didn't see you in Julius Caesar. It was nice of you to come. I'm sure you have people to get to. No, my, my people came opening night. Look, I'm sorry about... No, 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 no. Not necessary. I actually had a moment when, you know, I thought I might come owe you an apology. And that's why I stopped by the... It passed. You stir me up. Can I take you to get a drink or something? No. It's an interesting play. I know, right? And nobody's mom was on crack. Nope. No crack in Ibsen. Could we try again? Dinner, maybe? I told my girlfriends about you. There's some debate as to whether you're a sociopath or just a horrible person. Okay, then. Good luck with your life. I really do appreciate that you came. Valerie exits. Scene eight. Brian sits at a table in a restaurant. He has been waiting for some time. Finally, Ginny sweeps in. A uh, dissertation defense ran late. I, I should have called. Yes. I'm sure you thought I wasn't. Yes. I should have called you back. How was your week? Two weeks, Ginny. I've had better. Yours? Busy. Of course. When we first met, you joked about the prevalence of my people in the sciences. We joked. You just said you joked. You laughed. That's we. They don't give us tenure, Brian. Asian American women, our tenure rate is seriously something like none to every 20 white guys. I don't do self-reflective. You know that. I've yet to meet a psychologist who does. So I have this client. This girl at the clinic, she came in today, couldn't be more than 17, and she's so smart. Just really could have the world. She's not particularly pretty, but Asian goes a long way. 
oh, I heard myself say that. <laughs> you know what she does? She comes home from school and does her homework and then does the books and schedules for her family's business. She's up until 2 a.m. every night and she's not going to get out, Brian. None of these Harvard Asians are from her world, our world. Most of us never get out. She'll work those books and her brother will inherit the business and she'll marry and have kids and they won't get out of Chinatown either. She says, I don't really have problems, but you give me a Barnes and Noble gift card if I come for six weeks, right? And we sit and stare at one another and sometimes just because she feels sorry for me, she tells me about a test that she's nervous about or something. And today I gave her a big stack of $20 gift cards and suggested she exfoliate her forehead every now and then and to always use condoms and gave her my blessing. I shouldn't have run away. I don't do girlfriend well. I've never actually done girlfriend. That's fine. But I do want you to know that I was properly chastised. Your punishment was diabolically effective. I tortured myself. I looked good and hard and long at the white male patriarchal asshole you'd proven me to be. I had an existential crisis. But then you know what? I realized that I got off. What did you get out of it? The satisfaction of a job well done? We'll never be close enough for that to be funny. <sighs> I'm sorry. Okay. Ginny, you don't say I'm sorry. That's not unnurturing, that's just not nice. I'm sorry. Thank you. Can you be okay that I'm better at everything than you? Can you try to be nice? Yes. Then I will endeavor to. Can we please go home and make up Spoon? Scene nine. Jackson at the hospital speaks to an angry superior. Yes, sir, but I'm doing twice the rounds. Yes, I understand that. There's a file folder right there behind the nursing station that says resident rescheduling requests. Yes. And I filled it out fully expecting a superior would say yes or no, and you're getting on me for just filling it out? I've never asked for a, never missed a day, never been late. I just needed to pick my brother up from the, all you had to do was say yes or no. But you're reprimanding me for asking. I don't know what this is. You want to break me. You want me to lose my mind trying to rationalize why you might want me broken. You are pathologically committed to seeing me fail, but not just fail. You want my soul dead. You want to kill my soul. But I get it now. I can't do my work if my soul is broken. My soul must be intact for me to do my work. Please feel free to tell yourself and your colleagues that you have won, if that's what you need to do, because I'm out. Scene 10, 2008. Brian, Jackson, and Ginny are mid-meal. There's an untouched place setting, a long time of the men on either side of Ginny watching her text. For Jackson, it's amusing. For Brian, beyond annoying. Uh, I'm sorry, guys. Just one thing. I didn't send. I think I composed, but didn't. What if you didn't hit send? Would <sighs> would the world end, do you think? Shit. Okay. Here we go. There it is. Okay. She lays the phone face down. Okay. I'm sorry. No hide off my back. This is great. Brian did the chicken. It's good. Thank you. Well, next time we invite you over, maybe Ginny will actually put her phone down for five minutes. I'm totally present. Are you offended, Jackson? No. I mean, it's bad manners, but I'm not offended. Brian's phone has been docked on a speaker in the credenza. It rings. He pointedly doesn't get it. The ring stops. The music continues. Look at what just happened. It rang. I didn't answer. It stopped ringing. And we're all okay.
Are you sure you gave your girl Friday the right time? Yes. Shit, that would have been her. Jeannie's phone rings. She tries not to, but is physically incapable of not looking. Oh, it's... Hey, uh, so you got the waivers? That's great! Uh, listen, I'm gonna need to call you back. The doorbell rings. Good, here she is. I'll... He leaves to go get her. She's late. I already don't like her. You don't have to like her. I don't think it was a setup. Of course it was. Well, I don't even know her, but I really don't think it was a setup. I get the impression you're doing okay for yourself. Valerie enters, followed by Brian. She walks straight to Ginny without seeing Jackson. I am so sorry I'm late. It's nice to meet you. Likewise. She's pretty. She's pretty. <laughs> Nikki? Valerie sees Jackson. Oh my god. Really? Really. What? So Jackson, Valerie, Valerie Jackson. Valerie Ginny. Valerie? Valerie Johnston. You two have met? On several occasions. So you orchestrated this? Don't flatter yourself. I had no idea. That's Angry Girl? Valerie? Oh. Oh. Seriously? It's like that fucking Kevin Bacon game. What? Pulls a bottle of wine from her bag. Oh god, I, I do have manners. Here, I brought this. Th thank you. I don't know what the Kevin Bacon game is, and I don't understand how your name isn't Nikki. We met at Jackson's clinic, right? Oh. Oh, oh, right. Uh, well, it's... Good to see you again. Uh, Brian, your house is beautiful. I'm so sorry I'm late. I had a rehearsal in New York, then I couldn't get a cab. So of course, I missed my train. Wait, you're in a show in New York and you didn't tell me? Schenectady. Schenectady? I can put New York on my resume. Wouldn't people in the real New York know? Do I try to tell you about racist brains? Mm, she has a point. Well, but she does. You do. All the time. So, how you doing, man? Oh yeah. How are you holding up, Brian? Really? You saw me yesterday. People, no one died. Why don't you guys sit down? Here, Val, let me heat up a plate for you. Wine? Red. Do you have a nice smell back? Really, man. How you doing? I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Ryan exits. How is he doing? Is he okay? Well, it sucks. He just told me to show up for, the, for a pity party. I assumed it was a setup. What happened? I just saw him a few days ago. He didn't say anything. He's not been talking about it. A couple of weeks ago, the dean summoned him. He thought he'd get his usual slap on the wrist for something he said somewhere. They do that, he and the dean. It's part of their dynamic. Uh, but instead, he gets the talk. Brian returns with Valerie's plate. Oh, you're providing context for the evening's festivities. Uh, thanks. Jenny thinks I'm depressed. I didn't say that. I just thought you could use a little cheering up. It would be okay to be depressed. I'm not depressed. I'm pissed off. Anger is the flip side of depression. My therapist told me that. You have a therapist? <laughs> okay. Yeah, so the dean calls me in, and there's this guy I haven't met before, and he's introduced to me. I don't remember his, what his name is. It doesn't matter. He's their legal counsel, and I should have known then, but I didn't know. He fired you? They, they do that? They just fire you? In academia, it's more like, we should talk about your prospects here, and they deny you tenure and don't renew your contract. Your colleagues are actually legally bound not to talk to you about it to avoid litigation, so no one says anything, not even good morning. You're shunned. This time last year, I'm sitting in the dean's office and he's telling me that he's never seen anyone for whom the tenure process would just be perfunctory. Like you was in like Flynn, man. In like Flynn? He really was their golden boy. It turned on a dime. When? When they knew I was right. What did they think, that I was a, a hobbyist? They loved it when I went rogue. I'd be like, Harvard's racist. And they'd be like, ooh, say it some more, baby. And I'd be like, Harvard is entrenched in historical racism. And they'd be like, now hit it from the back. I 
Uh, so, uh, Jenny, Brian tells me you study Chinese people? Yeah, she's exploiting the poor girls at my clinic. Wait, you and Jackson work together. So Kevin Bacon. She's doing a study with some girls there. Women. They're Chinese, they're short. They get confused. I'm sorry, can we back up? There's a game about Kevin Bacon. Theater game. Or drinking game. Six degrees of separation. Premise being every actor is six rolls away from a movie with Kevin Bacon in it. Why? Because in the small spaces between inevitable disappointment and despair, humans have to occupy themselves with something. Why not Kevin Bacon? Listen, Brian, I've been thinking about it. You're an amazing scholar. Are we doing this? Please don't. No, no, no smoke. I know I give you shit, but really, man, I'm proud of you. Hey, Brian, look over here. I'm going to distract him. Look over here, Brian. See, I'm going to jolt you out of your funk. Ready? Yes, Val, I'm ready. Admit that this was a setup. You were so totally trying to set us up. Yep. Called that too. Right? White people are always sending me up with their only other black friend. You're not my only black friend, Jackson. He's not. He's my only friend. I'm your friend. Aww. It's kind of sweet. Did you think maybe he would be the guy I'd spend my life with because he has melanin too? Hey, Valerie, look over here. Why don't you have any black friends? I'm Brian. What? She doesn't. Do you? Not really. I want to. I try. Uh, well, you have Jackson now. Yeah, no. Um, but I do try to only date black men. <laughs> Why? Because they're hot. Yeah. I can hear you. I'm sorry, Brian. Was that emasculating? Did I emasculate him? Jackson, I hope we didn't make you feel objectified. It's fine. I'll get another gig. Of course I'll get another gig. Stanford will take me in a second, and I can be that liberal white guy bumping my head against the conservative agenda, feeling really good about myself and misunderstood, and nothing will change. You know, it's what you study. She's right. They hate you for what you study. You tell a bunch of liberal-minded, kind-hearted, soft intellectuals that they're racist. By nature, it's fucked up. Let me paint a picture. So you're this white guy on the select committee of a big grantor fellowship. Let's make it the MacArthur. That's the genius grant. So you're the white and on this decision-making committee, it's morning, you've just poured the coffee in the travel mug, you've said goodbye to maybe your black wife or your Latino lover or your Latin Asian husband. And you kiss your adopted Senegalese baby on the cheek and you come to the meeting with all your colleagues half of whom reached 45 and decided to become parents, so have little cute babies that look like Ginny. That's racist. Am I true? They love those babies. More than they knew they could ever love anything, right? So there you are, Mr. Down with the environment, up with diversity, I'm a good guy, guy. You open a folder and the study you're supposed to consider giving an award to says that your brain, your chemistry, registers black as repulsive. And you're going to give that an award? I told him that. You know what it is? It's like you've been turned into a black man, right? It's like they're treating him like he's black. Here he is, charismatic, intelligent, articulate. You are very articulate. I told him that. I told you that. Pretty soon you won't even be able to get a cab. <laughs> like a black man. And you start to think, maybe it's me. That's why you're so upset. You're thinking, maybe they're right. Maybe I've wasted all this time and you're feeling a little crazy, right? You're feeling like, I played by the rules. I played it better. My ideas are valid. I'm articulate. I'm attractive. So why does nobody hear me? They're treating you like you're a nigger. They're supposed to hear me. But why? You don't understand. They're supposed to hear me. Why? Because. Because? I know what he's going to say. Because I'm the white guy. And there it is. So, 
I realize you're a little down. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pretend. Well, no, I'm going to choose to believe that you didn't just say because I'm the white guy. Yeah. I'm going to believe that because you're evolved, you didn't just have some sort of existential white boy crisis because your white privilege didn't work out today. Shut up. Brian. Shut up. You just said shut up to me. Dude, I had shit I could be doing. I'm only here to make your ass feel better. Everyone's here to support you. Don't do this, Brian. See, we should have just called this an election party. You can't celebrate a termination. My thought too. I was trying to be nurturing. See, about these things, you all will always trump me. And, and that's fine. I can take it because I'm the guy who gets it. But just be me for a second. And pretend that you did grow up around people of color, that there was never been some big mystique or great deal of white guilt, just enough proximity to see it. And an early desire to fix it, this shit we live in, so I devote my life to trying to work that shit out, and I do. Wait, let's just give me the benefit of the doubt since none of you actually do data analysis or make stereotype content models or can read brain scans. Well, I can. My point. I've proven it. I set out with a hypothesis, I followed protocols, and I fucking proved something monumental. So what I meant when I said, I'm the white guy, is that I'm the white guy at Harvard. Who do people listen to? What, whose press releases get read and written about in the New York Times? Who's the first person they call in when something vaguely smelling of whatever happens? The white guy from Harvard. The white guy from Harvard has an inherited platform and I've got the numbers and I'm right and everyone knows it and I get from all of them, shut up, you're threatening our inheritance, our carefully constructed world of entitlement. We have the power to silence you because your shit blows it all up in our faces and God forbid white liberals are forced to look long and hard at themselves. God forbid they see it. But you know it's a mindfuck. But the mindfuck isn't the racism. The mindfuck is how dexterous my people are at seeing it selectively. If I'm a redneck, I don't hate you because I'm racist. I hate you because you took my jobs and my status. If I'm a white liberal, I don't hate you. I sort of pity you, but I don't hate you. I just don't really want a, you to live in my neighborhood. In fact, I, don't, I want to move into yours and make you move out so I can build a Trader Joe's. I'm so not racist that I'll let a handful of the best of your children go to my child's school. I'm not racist. I don't notice that everyone at my job is white. In fact, I'm so not racist that I've been virulently critiquing that for years. I'm so, so, so not racist. Just please don't fuck my daughter. I just think you make it hard for yourself. Sweetie, I know you mean well. You can't possibly- I get where you're coming from, Brian. I've been there. And then I realized sometimes you're gonna get treated like a nigga. And you refocus and put your energies where they're most needed and fight the battle from a different angle. But we've got nothing in common, Jackson. You didn't get treated like a- L Like a what, motherfucker? You didn't get treated like a- You got treated like a man who couldn't listen to authority. And then you quit. You did that to yourself over and over again. You got treated like the hot-headed black man with a chip on his shoulder that you are. I got treated like a nigger. Have you lost your mind? Has he lost his fucking- Wait, hold on. I'm so sick of hearing preternaturally beautiful people with intelligence and financial viability bitch about their lot. You know what? Life sucks. All around, for all of us unilaterally, life sucks. Only white people have nothing else upon which to pin it. Every fucking thing that happens to us is our own poor judgment and bad luck. So all y'all motherfuckers can kiss my white ass. He stands, begins to exit, turns around. And another thing? It's not the end of the world to be exoticized, Ginny. Like it's some fucking curse to be someone who everyone wants to fuck. Brian begins his exit. And the genius grant is stupid. He exits. Good luck with that, Jenny. What makes me crazy is that he has the luxury to let this shit explode his head. Who the fuck gets to go into a tirade because race in America is a mind fuck? Do you get to get, get down because you get treated like shit twice a day? No. Hmm? Do you, Jenny? I'm sorry, what? 
oh, were you talking to me? I'm part of this conversation. Because <laughs> I was having to just sit over here in the corner uh, with the Latinos and some Middle Easterners and a handful of Native Americans left. I was just happy to sit here and watch your conversation about race because it's just black and white. So I'll just sit here and let you all work that out. Wow. We do that, don't we? Yeah, you do. But it's cool. Yeah, Margarita Perez, Andela Abood, and Rise with the frickin' Moon Youngblood, and I will just sit over here and exchange shocking anecdotes about nail salons and airport security and, I don't know, genocide. Brian returns, continuing to remove the plates from the table. Thank you. Brian exits to the kitchen. So, how did you meet Jackson, Jenny? I went into his clinic and he assumed I'd been beaten. <laughs> yeah, me too. At the hospital. <laughs> the nurse gave me the, are you safe in your home? And I was like, last time I checked. It took like five minutes to understand what they were asking, which I guess is nice that they were, you know, cons concerned. Then Jackson wants to know who beat me and I'm playing that out in my mind and I think... Did they really think that someone was like, yo, bitch, put on that Elizabethan costume and get over here so I can beat your ass? There's not a damn thing funny about domestic violence. Jackson, do you see how you do that? Two politically conscious liberals were enjoying a moment of irreverent levity and you shat on it. It is totally a power play. You can always turn a room with, that's not funny. Watch. Hey, Jenny, did you hear the one about the priest, the prostitute, and the paraplegic? That's not funny. See? Now you feel very bad, right? Because you kind of wanted to hear the joke. There's no joke. That would be sick. You gonna need a ride, Val? Sure, I guess. Thanks. Brian has returned with dessert on a tray. Little individual trifles. Wait, don't go. Hey, Jenny, do the Thanksgiving thing. Go, go on, do it. Maybe we should just... Seriously, not. she does the best impersonation of my sister. What are you doing? If she doesn't want to... Just tell the goddamn story. Please. Yeah, Jackson, I'll get my coat. It was right before dinner. We haven't even carved the turkey. And they just keep razzing her. Razzing? They're just picking and picking. You haven't met Brian's sister, have you? It doesn't matter. The one with the kid. I need to go. Let her finish. And then I do have to go. I have to catch an early flight. I have an audition in LA. Oh, okay. Uh, so there we are, like Norman Rockwell, except Jimmy's literally bouncing off the walls. I thought it was a saying, but there's boys ricocheting off of the walls, and you just know that something disastrous is about to happen. And Brian's mother is telling Brian's dad to just say the prayer. And dad's saying, not until the boy actually sits at the table. And Miriam's just sitting there. And now Jimmy's crawling under the table, has PDD and OS. Is that a real thing? It's somewhere between ADHD, Asperger's, and hell. It's, he's just so smart and sweet and weird. So Miriam puts her napkin down and she stands up. Here it comes. I just want to say before we eat that if anyone else has something to say about my parenting, they can kiss my ass because Aunt Rachel could stand to lose 40 pounds. Uncle Walter is on his fourth vodka gimlet and uh, Susie has always been a bitch. And I don't comment on any of those things. Shit, dessert. I should help. Brian doesn't move. Ginny jumps up. You always make me do that. She exits to the kitchen. Valerie joins her, clearing whatever's left on the table. Here, let me. Brian hands her his plate. Valerie exits. I know I've heard every one of you say to me in various ways at some time or another, what the fuck is wrong with your people? We were right there with that, weren't we? I thought we were. Jackson gets up to leave, meaning at this time. I'm sorry 
I was completely out of line with the black man chip on your shoulder shit. So, out of line. I do see how fucked up that was. Good. Valerie and Ginny enter with dessert and dishes. Val, you still gonna need a ride. Valerie collects her things. So, thank you, Ginny, Brian. It was a lovely evening. They leave. Ginny begins to eat her dessert. Brian starts to clear the tables. Finally. All I'm trying to say Don't. is... Lights out. Epilogue. January 20th, 2009. Everyone in their separate area. Brian is scruffy, deeply concentrated. On a sofa surrounded by boxes and lab equipment, he sits on his couch. He's covered in electrodes, finger in an oxygen measure, syringes and vials of blood on a tray next to him. He's hooked up to a portable EEG. He looks at a small television, it's back to us. Ginny on her couch, comfortably ensconced in a cashmere throw, drinks coffee, half watches television, half thumbs through a restoration hardware catalog. She's on the phone with Valerie, reporting events of Obama's inauguration. Oh my God, it's yellow. A, a nod to Jackie, but with a flare. Light rises on Valerie on the phone with Ginny. She now sports the long, well-maintained, not cheap, weave requisite for all TV ingenues. She wears a well-tailored shearling coat, matching hat, expensive winter boots. She could be a starlet on a Macy's float. She holds an American flag and a Starbucks cup. She faces the audience fighting the crush of an unseen crowd far away from the video monitors. No, uh, it's green. Chartreuse. I can barely see a screen. Can you hear me? I thought you had fancy I'm on a TV show tickets. I'm in the back of the barely fancy Silas standing only area. It's like a mile away from the B plus list. I thought Chartreuse was pink. Uh, they're coming out of the church, getting into cars. Can you hear me? I should call you from a landline. Brian fiddles with knobs and buttons on his machines. The energy and concentration of a scientist on the edge of his most important discovery. Brian looks at screens, makes notes, types on his laptop, searches his arm for a vein. No, 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 don't hang up. I wish you were here. <laughs> Unbelievable. Oh my God, she's beautiful. Has he come out? Yeah, you know, he looks like he always does. So handsome. <laughs> Brian makes a fist finds a vein, ties on a band. Searches again for the best vein. It's hard to find, maybe he switches arms. Ah, oh, just beautiful, the whole family. Ah, the girls are so cute. So fucking cold. Oh, little coats. Oh my God, they're getting in the car. Seriously, <laughs> freezing my ass off. What are you doing? Looking at the back of Rue McClanahan and B. Arthur's head. <laughs> oh, Michelle's mom's getting into the car. She's going to take care of the girls. God, why didn't I come with you? Oh, his sister's there with the family. <laughs> oh my God, his family's like the fucking United Nations. It's audacious. Brian draws blood. He turns on the EEG. Paper starts to scroll out. It's exciting. It's so exciting. It's cold and it's exciting. Oh, I wish I were there. Then we'd both be cold and not knowing what's going on. But it doesn't matter. It's so exciting. It's, it's so what? So what, Valerie? Valerie's lost her signal. Uh, uh, so, Hello? So what? Hello? Did I lose you? Valerie. Damn. Ginny? Valerie. Can you get Valerie. a signal? Maybe. Ginny? Gin? Valerie. I'll call you back. If you can hear I'll me, call you back, back, okay? Ginny. Can you get a signal? Valerie's light goes out abruptly. The familiar custom ring of Jackson's phone brings up his apartment. Jackson watches television as he prepares for work. Yes, Ma. I'm watching. Really? I see. I see. Of course I'm excited. Yes. Ma, are you crying? But you're okay. Okay, I know. I know, me too. No, I get it. It could have been me. No, I moved. Seriously. I'm just trying to get to the clinic. He stares at the TV, keys in hand, frozen. Don't cry. Oh, Ma. Don't cry. Ginny's phone rings. Val? Valerie's light is back on. This is it. Brian turns up the volume on his TV. 
We hear the sound of the president being sworn in. They all take it in. The lights take a long fade on Valerie, Jackson, and Ginny, leaving Brian alone with his couch and machines and boxes. Eventually, only Brian is lit by the light of his television screen, sound of EEG machine ticking, sound of president being sworn in. Brian sits, watches. The print out from the EEG flows from the machine like it's ticker tape. It prints and prints and prints. End of play. Are you prepared to take the oath, Senator? I am. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do I, Barack, solemnly swear. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear. That I will execute the office of President to the United States faithfully. That I will execute the off faithfully the president office of president of the, the office United of president States of the United States faithfully and will to the best of my ability and will to the best of my ability preserve protect and defend the constitution of the United States preserve protect and defend the constitution of the United States so help you god so help me god congratulations mr president <laughs> Thanks, you guys. <laughs> Thank you, Sophie. And Laura from Tate. And Edwin. <laughs> Sarah Harmer and friends and family. Thank you. Brenna. Hi, Brenna. Hi, Hi Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Abby, more virtual theater coming your way. Yeah, you, you, you just married. wait. I love you too. <laughs> Who doesn't, honestly? <laughs> like, <laughs> and thank you, Andrea. <laughs> wow. Oh my goodness. You guys are so sweet. Thank you. <laughs> Solomon and med school friends, thank you all so much for tuning in. Thank you. Sully, thank, thank you. Anthony. Michelle O'Donnell, thank you so much. Oh my gosh, you yes, guys. Yes, Maori, I have beans. <laughs> Thanks, Aunt Judy. Love you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, maybe picking up the cat was too much of a distraction. <laughs> Put her down here. That's the benefits of that home theater is the cats get to be in the curtain call right? as well. All the cats. <laughs> oh, Laura. Can you imagine? Another fantastic Michelle with the last name out. Sarah Harmer. Oh, thank you. Karis, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. <laughs> and hi, Ashley, Ayo, and Joe. Thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for that wonderful comment. Oh my gosh. Oh. <sighs> thank you, Alex. 
Chelsea. <laughs> Thank you, Chelsea and Jamie. Thank you, Karis. That is a high, high praise. Thank you so yeah. much. <laughs> I've spent all summer watching Zoom plays and that's very flattering. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Yes, and it's available to stream all this weekend. So if anybody missed it or any of your friends want to see it, you'll be able to find it in the event page. Yes. Oh, Abby and Hum, thank you. <gasps> Tara Harbor. Thanks, Mom. Harbor. Oh. Who's mom? Oh, Corey's mom. Hi, Ms. Hi, Ms. Landis. Hi, Miss Judy. That was all cast. Yeah. <laughs> that was all, that's all these guys. <sighs> Star, sign us out. Thank you all so much. Um, I am so grateful to everyone um, who, <laughs> yeah, keep putting things in the chat while I'm talking. Um, I'm so grateful to everyone who tuned in. Thank you so much. We will be coming back maybe next month with some more pandemic theater, definitely October because that's my birthday month and I love to do fun things for my birthday. And then in November, um, I want, I want, I have an idea for something in November that I'm not going to reveal just yet. Um, but I think we'll really, I think we'll really knock it out of the park in, in November as well. Thank you, Moira. Thank you so much for tuning in. <laughs> Thank you for the very early happy birthday wish. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Oh, Lando, hi. Thank you so much. Oh, Brenna, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this will be recorded um, permanently. I have not, I don't know about distribution rights. That's something we would have to talk to with the licensing company um, because I'm sure that involves money. But if it is available, I would, I would love to share that with folks as a teaching tool, as a discussion point. Jason, did you? She's a teacher at my school, so nice. we can connect through. Yes, that'd be great. Awesome, thank you. All right, well, I think we're going to say good night. I'm gonna let my cast go get some sleep. They've been working so hard this week and this will be uploaded to our YouTube channel either tonight or early tomorrow morning. And tell your friends, it'll be available to stream all weekend. Tell your friends to watch it, get some popcorn, get some friends together. Um, yeah, thank you all so much. We really appreciate all the support. Thank you.